going to have a great day in the Lord today. So if we can, let's set up these scriptures here. Then what advantage has a Jew or what's the benefit of circumcision? Great in every respect. First of all, they were entrusted with the oracles of God. Enough of the anti-Semitism in the world today, especially among Christians. How can a Christian be an anti-Semite? Or do you not know that you've been grafted in? You've got no reason to brag at all. Anti-Semitism in the church, I mean, come on, it's an oxymoron. God looked over the face of the earth and said, I choose the Jews. And it's because he blessed them that we're blessed. So we bless the Jews. We don't curse them. We don't hunt them down and persecute them. It's because of them that we got what we got. So I don't, know, I don't understand anti-Semitism in the church. Got no place here. What then? If some do not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God. Will it? May it never be. Rather, let God be found true and every man a liar. For it is written that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you, were, when you were judged. But if our righteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? The God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous, is he? For I'm speaking in human terms. May it never be, for otherwise how will God judge the world? But if through my life the truth of God abounded to his glory, why am I still being judged as a sinner? And why not say, as some as slenderly reported as me uh, claim that we, that we say, let us do evil that good may come. Their condemnation is just. See, there's some people in the church who feel like, well, now I'm saved, I can act any old way I want to act. That's false. You've been saved under good works. God has changed your life. There should be a process of sanctification going on within your life to set you apart so that you don't look like what you came into the kingdom 50 years from now. Can I get a witness in the house of God? Now that process takes a while. And we shared a couple of weeks ago that the road to repentance is rocky. But yet and still, brothers and sisters, God wants to do a work in us if we'll just let him. But there are some people who say that we can just behave any old way that we want to. Their condemnation is just. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. Don't get the big head. For we've already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none not righteous, no, not even one. There is not one who understands. There is no one who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is no one who does good. There's not even one. Their throats are an open grave with their tongues. They keep deceiving. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursings and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the paths of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we who know that Whoever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be closed and that the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Do you understand that, right? I wouldn't have known what was sin unless God said, don't do that. And as soon as God said, don't do that, what do I want to do? That that he told me not to do. So as soon as God said and created the law and created an atmosphere where I have, where he tells me not to do something, there's something that comes alive in me that wants to do that. I wouldn't have known what sin was if God didn't say don't do it. God says don't do it and all of a sudden now it's a sin for me. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifest, being made witness by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Jesus Christ, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness both in forbearance of God. He passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of the righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith 
in Jesus. Now, I said a mouthful there. But what it boils down to is this. Without God making Jesus a public display of, 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 of ill repute and putting him on a cross and Jesus surrendering to that and shedding his blood for us, all of us are in a bind today. All of us are in a bind if we don't have the blood of Jesus applied to the doorpost of our souls. So we're going to talk today about the blood of Jesus. It's, can we be honest in the church? It's kind of weird to talk about blood. I'll be honest with you. There's times where I'm like, seriously, God? But the Bible is clear in the book of Hebrews. That without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. I want to unpack that for you. Because it does not mean that when Jesus came here, that all he had to do was to take a pocket knife or a razor blade or something and cut himself and just shed blood. When the Bible talks of shedding of blood, it means death. It means dying. And so what the Bible is saying is that when there is the shedding of blood or when there is dying, then there's forgiveness of sins. So the blood had to come from not just anybody, it had to come from a sinless person. Jesus steps on the scene. He's the only one that could have done it. He had to die. Why, Pastor John, does, there, does God require death in order to cover up a sin? Why couldn't God just say, you know what? Everything's okay. Everything's all right. I'll just forget it. Jonathan, don't worry about it, man. It's all good. Why can't God just do that? Why does someone have to die because of sin? Listen, it's always been the case. There has to be death to cover up sin. God even warned Adam and Eve in the garden. You sin, you're going to die. Their sin is equated with death. You got sin, you got to die. Why, Pastor John? Why does, that, why does someone have to die? Why can't God just say, it's all right, don't, don't worry about it. I'll forget it. Why can't God do that? Because the Bible also says that God is just. He's just. He has to do this. Just like there's justice in our land. We can't, we can't go to the prisons and say, hey, forget about it. Turn all the murderers loose. No, we, we can't do that. There, there is a just society in which we live. There has to be such a thing called justice. Same with God. When you die, you're going to stand before him. There's going to have to be some justice on behalf of your life. Something is going to have to give because you have done things to offend a God who created you. And there has to be justice. Listen, I mean, even the federal government will kill somebody over treason. Won't they? The federal government will kill you if you commit treason. And here we've got a God who created us and we've sinned against him and we have created treason and done treason against the one who created us. That's called sin. And the only way, you got to listen to me. This is so unpopular in this culture in which we live. But you got to hear it because the word says it's true. The only thing that will reconcile you to a holy God because you have commit, committed treason, the only thing that will reconcile you back to God is the death and the blood and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is it. 
It's it. Pastor John, surely there's another way. There is no other way. Our culture will tell you that there's many ways to God. Our culture will lie to you. And I'm going to tell you what the Word says about the blood today because we need it. We're in desperate need of it. Now, there's a whole lot of goodness that comes from the blood of Jesus. There's certainly going to be forgiveness, and we're going to talk about this today because today's Communion Sunday. I want to try my best for you to get you to wrap your mind around it. The first thing I want you to see here today is that the blood of Jesus is precious. <sighs> Brothers and sisters, precious. Look at this scripture verse here. Knowing that you are not redeemed with perishable things. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. You were not redeemed with silver and gold. God didn't lay down a bunch of silver and gold and said, I'll buy back Kristen. She's committed treason against me. I'll buy her back. I own the cattle on a thousand hillsides. I'll pay money to get her back. He didn't do that. He sent Jesus to die for. So you got to understand that the blood of Jesus is more precious than silver or gold. It's the most precious thing in this world, according to the scriptures. Thanks be to God for it. We were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from our futile way that we inherited from our forefathers. I know a lot of us love our mamas and daddies, but they were nuts too. And we inherited all kind of weirdness from them, including the ability to sin and to commit treason against our God. But God sent His Son to die for us, to shed his blood for us, to redeem us because silver and gold couldn't buy you back to a holy God that takes the blood of Jesus. It's a precious blood because it's a lamb that's unblemished and spotless. It's one of the most important fundamental truths in Christianity, that it took a sinless Jesus to die for us, to reconcile us back to a holy God. A lot of people don't want to look as God as, 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 as Jesus Christ as God anymore, do they? They'll, they want to look upon him as some kind of philosopher, don't they? In our culture, that's what they want us to look at Jesus as. If, if, if our culture, if we can tell our culture that Jesus was one of these hipsters that wore a robe and sandals and had a beard, right? And walked the Judean countryside and smoked dope, they're all for that. If we can create Jesus as some kind of person who just walks around the countryside saying, Peace, y'all love one another, chill out. If we can create that kind of Jesus in our culture, they're all for it. But as soon as you say that he's the son of God, and then only through him do you have redemption, then they'll go sideways with you. They'll go sideways with you. There's something that happens in our culture when you say the name of Jesus. People freak out, don't they? Mention his name in government. They freak out. Mention the name of Jesus on the news. They freak out. God forbid you even mention his name in the schoolhouse. They freak Mention his name at, at work, and there is a visceral reaction to people. They react. Who? What? Whoa. They react to the name of Jesus. But I'm here to tell you, it's his precious blood that saves us. Yes. And I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but I need it. I'm in desperate need of it. 
Desperate need of it. Jesus' blood is precious. Treat it holy, brothers and sisters. Treat it holy. You know what else Jesus' blood is? Powerful. I'll tell you again, it's powerful. There's nothing like it. Look at Revelation 12 and 11. Check this out. And they overcame him. That's Satan. Hear me. They, that's you and me. We overcome Satan because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when they faced were death. There is something about the power that's in the blood of Jesus. We used to sing that song, there is power, power, wonder working power. In the blood of the Lamb. I used to get a lead worship, watch out now. I know what that power's like. It took that power to break my former way of living. I know what the power of Jesus is like. Because it broke strongholds in my life. I know that the blood of Jesus is powerful. I've testified it from this pulpit. I know what the power of Jesus can do in the life of a believer. I know. I know it. Like I know my own name. I know what the power of Jesus' blood can do. Nobody can convince me otherwise. I've got a testimony. I've got one. Because I've been tested and I've came through it. Therefore, I've got a testimony. You hear that? Because I've been tested. Run through the ringer. I feel like preaching today. Sorry. I don't know if it's this shirt or these orange shoes. But I'm, I'm, I'm trying my best to... To restrain myself today because I I, I know what Jesus' blood can do. It's powerful. It has given me a testimony that nobody can take away. People can theorize if Jesus is the Son of God or not all they want. But I'm here to tell you that I have overcome the evil one because of the testimony that he's given me. And nobody can take that away from me. His blood is powerful. It can break every chain. There are people in here today. You've got chains that are binding you up. You're not free. I've got good news for you, baby. There is power in the blood of Jesus. And it will set you free. It will set you free. It has the power to break every chain. Thanks be to God for the power of Jesus. That's why in that small church that I gave my heart to Jesus in, When they would sing that old song, there's power in the blood, as I just sang, I couldn't help it, brothers and sisters. I sat on the back row. I'd run full speed all the way to the front of the church, and I'd run up and down through here, yelling with all of my might because I'd been set free. I know those people in that small church in Alabama thought I was a nut. 
said, my God, this guy's come in here. He shook up it all. We just want to have church. He's in here running around and yelling. They had not been delivered from what I've been delivered from. I'd been set free. And I wanted to let the world know it. And so I'd yell. I'm a demonstrative person. What can I say? But I'd come down and run. Give God praise. The only way I knew how. I couldn't be dignified. You know what I'm saying? I couldn't sit on the back row, Lord, I thank you. I couldn't do that. I'd been set free, man. I had to get, now listen, if, if this is you, do you. If this is your personality, be you. I couldn't do that. I had to be more wild or something. I don't know. It's just, and it wasn't that I was trying to be showy or put on airs or anything like that. I was just happy that I'd been set free. That's all. It was the blood of Jesus that did it for me. I tried. I had tried. To break my former way of life. That futile way that I had inherited from my daddy and my mama. But nothing worked. I wanted to get free from those things. But they had me in bondage and they had me bound down. And I couldn't, I couldn't get free. It was the blood of Jesus that did it. He gave me a testimony. And I overcome this world because of my testimony. And because of the blood of the Lamb. Praise God for that. Let people talk all they want that he's not the Son of God. I know better. He's done too much for me. I've seen him move too marvelously in people's lives. I know the deal. Praise God. I feel something. Now. You know what else the blood of Jesus does? Cleanses. <laughs> you got to have some of that. Look at this scripture verse in Hebrews chapter 9. How much more would the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? That's a power pack verse 2. It cleanses our conscience from dead works to serve God. You got to listen to me. There is a conscience in a, in a person. My mama used to tell me that. John, always listen to that small inner voice, your conscience. I was raised with that. And so I was raised with this conscience thing going on on the inside of me. There's only one problem with that. The Bible says that your conscience can be seared. First time I'd done something wrong, I had a bad conscience over it. I knew I shouldn't have done that. And my conscience wore me out over it. But the second time I'd done it, 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 my conscience wore me out a little less and a little less and a little less. And pretty soon you get to the point to where you don't think what you're doing is any wrong anymore. Your conscience has been severed. You can sever your conscience, brothers and sisters. Bible says so. Here's what you cannot do. Get away from the convicting power of the Holy Ghost because it will wear you out. And thank God he wears us out. Thank God he's always on our case. Thank God he's always wooing us and drawing us by the blood of Jesus. Thank God for that. He wants to cleanse you. Make you white as snow. I've told you before. I don't know how a brown cow can eat green grass and give white milk. How does that work? I don't know. Just like I don't know how Jesus can take my black heart, dip it in red blood, and it come out white as snow. I don't get that. But I know it works. Cleanses us. Makes us who we are. Thanks be to God for the blood of Jesus. 
Woo! Communion today is going to light us up. Thank God for that. It's going to heal and set people free today. You say communion can do that? You better believe it. There's something powerful that takes place when we take communion. I don't believe that it's just some symbolic act that we do. Jesus Christ is going to be here in a special, tangible way today. I mean, if you're not in the kingdom and you take this stuff today, there's a warning. Now, listen, it's not for the people who are in the kingdom of God. It is for the people who are in the kingdom. The warning is for those outside the kingdom. Enough of all of my brothers and sisters who have accepted Jesus who says, I'm not perfect enough to take communion. Well, join the club. And they'll sit there and they won't take it because they've been taught that if they eat or drink of the blood of the Lord, uh, that, they'll, that they'll be doing it unworthily and they'll invite sickness into their body or they'll die. And that warning is there. No doubt about it. But it's not for those in the kingdom. It's for folks outside the kingdom. There's the table of the Lord and there's a table of demons, the Bible says. And you cannot be in the, law, in, the, in the world and participate in the table of demons and come over here and, take, and partake, participate in the table of the Lord. You can't do that. So before we take communion today, I'm going to make sure that everybody under the sound of my voice knows Jesus. Amen. And has the blood of Jesus applied to your soul. So get ready for that. The blood of Jesus cleanses. It does even more than that. According to the word, go to the next slide for me. The blood of Jesus justifies. You say, well, Pastor John, what's that mean? Glad you asked. When the Lord looks at you, anybody in here, me included. If he sees Jesus' blood, it looks like to him that you never sinned. <laughs> Listen to me, brothers and sisters. Like I mean like ever. The blood of Jesus justifies. The little boy's definition of that is just as if I'd never sinned. So the blood of Jesus, when you accept Jesus, you've got sin in your life. You've committed treason against the one who created you. And when you accept Jesus and he comes into your life and his blood is applied to your soul. It looks upon as God when he looks upon you as if you'd never sinned. No, not even one time, Dick Green. Not one time, brother. Somebody ought to shout about that. Because I had a lot of them. And they were storing up wrath for me. And I was going to get it on that great and terrible day. But thanks be to God for his blood that was applied to me. Because now they're nowhere to be found. So he forgives too. The blood of Jesus forgives us. Forgets about everything. The Bible says that he takes our sins, the ones that have been forgiven, and he places them into the deepest sea. That's what the word says. And do you know that the deepest sea on earth is twice as deep as the highest mountain. Do you know that? It's so deep that they can't even find life down there because of the pressure. Nothing lives down there in the deepest parts of the sea. There's no life down there except for Christians. 
swimming around down there, trying to find out and live through their old sins and always looking at life through a rear view mirror. Listen to Pastor John today. If God has forgiven you of that, forgive yourself of that, praise God, and move on. Be free from that stuff. Why would you bound yourself up because of something that you used to do? Why would you allow Satan to bind you up and constantly remind you of all the imperfections that you've had in your past? Listen to me, brothers and sisters. You're not as bad as all of that. You're better than the worst decision that you've ever made. Come on, somebody. You are. In Christ, you are better than that. And I know Satan wants to remind you of your past. He wants to remind me of my past all the time. But I'm here to tell you that I've been set free from that way of life. I don't have to live that way anymore. God has set me free. Why? Because of his blood. It's powerful. It's done a work in old Pastor John. you got to understand that. Same work that he's done for me, he'll do for you. He forgives you. He says he takes our sins and throws them into the deepest sea. He also says that he'll take our sins and remove them as far as the east is from the west. How many know that's true? Picture if you can in your mind a globe. Yes, a globe. The Bible did not say that he took our sins and removed them as far as the north is from the south. He said he removed them as far as the east is from the west. Now, if you can picture in your mind a globe, you can only go north so far. Come on, somebody. Because at some point, what are you going to start doing, somebody? You're going to start going south. So if the Lord said in his word that I've removed your sins as far as the north is from the south, there's going to come a part or a place where God is going to remember them and we're going to be in a bind. But he says, I have removed them. Now listen, this this word was written, right? Before they even knew that the world was round. We didn't know it, God did. He says, I'm removing them as far as the east is from the west. I want you to do me a favor and I want you to strike out of here and I want you to start going east. You know what you're going to do? You're going to keep going east. You will never, ever, ever start to go west. Ever. You keep going east, you just keep going east. You strike out of here and you start going west, you'll never run into east. You're just going to keep on running west. God has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. We'll never see those babies again. Come on, somebody ought to thank God for that. They're gone, man. Gone. So he justifies us, just as if we'd never sinned. Forgives us. Reconciles us. The blood reconciles us. Remember I told you, we got a holy God over here. Got sinful humanity over here. There's one mediator between God and man. That's Jesus Christ. Now, I know that there's a push right now, even among some circles, to make Mary co-redemptress with Jesus. I want you to listen to me. Mary didn't have sinless blood. Now she ought to be honored. She should be respected. She is not co-redemptress with Jesus. Mary had an earthly father just like you and I. She had a sinful nature. She committed sins. Jesus did not have an earthly father. His father is God in heaven. He did not inherit that sinful nature like the rest of us in this room did. It took that in order to reconcile a sinful humanity to a holy God. Jesus Christ did that. He alone deserves our praise and glory in this house. He will not share his glory with anybody. It's his and his alone. He earned it. He earned it when he willingly laid himself down. He surrendered it. He told the disciples, I could call 12 legions of angels here right now. Right now. 
A legion is a thousand. He said, I could call 12,000 angels here right now to protect me. But I choose not to. I'm going to willingly lay my life down. Greater hath no man than this, that he would lay down his life for another. The darling of heaven, the rose of Sharon, willingly laying his life down to save an old redneck like me. It's scandalous when you think about it. But he reconciled me to God. And now in the face of God, I stand whole, complete, healed, set freed, delivered, a child of the All this stuff is mine. And I receive it and walk in that every day. You say, Pastor John, you act like you expect to be healed. Of course. It's mine. I'm a child of the king. He loves me. You can walk in that life where you just think that God's going to get you all you want. I choose to believe that God loves me. Didn't spare no expense for me. Gave me everything I've ever had. You hear me? I've got nothing without God. Nothing. I keep pre- if I stop preaching today and I resign from fam church today, I've got nothing. He's given me everything. Everything, Ambrose, I've ever got is because God gave it to me. We're signing the loan on a home on Wednesday. How do you do that? How, how does somebody like me do that? God. That's the only answer. He just, he's good. It's because of his blood and my obedience. And God does what he does. He reconciles. This was just dropped in my spirit. There are people here today who need to be reconciled with people in your family. Jesus' blood can do that. Some of you are estranged from your parents and your brothers and sisters and people and friends and stuff. There's been a separation. There's been a falling out. Something sideways has come and crept in. The blood of Jesus reconciles. It doesn't only reconcile us to him, but it reconciles humanity. Because if I can be reconciled to God, I can be reconciled to my brother and sister. I can be reconciled to my family member. I can be reconciled with my wife and my husband and my children and my whatever. There is reconciliation that can take place between folks. Can I get a witness in the house? That was dropped in my spirit for somebody. Sanctifies. The blood of Jesus sanctifies us. What's that, Pastor John? Sets you apart. Sets you apart. There's something in the... Oh, thank you, God. There is something inside the heart of a believer that thinks that we can behave and act just like the world and the world will accept us. Listen to old Pastor John. No, they won't. They will never, ever accept us. But that's okay. Because I'm not trying to be accepted by the world. I'm trying to be acceptable to God. Huge difference. The blood of Jesus sanctifies me. Now listen to me. According to the book of Hebrews, I'm already sanctified. Some people want to be sanctified by what they do. They think that they're going to be sanctified in the eyes of uh, of the Lord by what they wear. How they keep their hair. I was raised around that stuff. You want to be sanctified? You want to be set apart for the Lord? Women don't ever cut your hair. How many of you remember that? 
you had to put up in a great big old ball and a knot on the head, remember? And in their eyes, that's what sanctified them. That's what set them apart was that they never cut their hair. Some ladies think that, and isn't it funny how it always goes to the ladies? Some people think that they're, some ladies think they're sanctified if they always wear a dress. Don't ever wear britches. Some women think they're sanctified if they never wear makeup. Ladies, go on, wear it. Sometimes two coats works. Hashtag me too. Men, don't you let your hair touch your collar. Your hair touches your collar. You're not sanctified in the eyes of the Lord. Men, don't wear some kind of wristwatch. Chris and I have walked in those churches, remember, babe? No wristwatches, no rings, nothing showy. You get up in some of the Mennonite communities, your sanctif- sanctification is based on other things. Chris and I have met Mennonites where you can have a car, but if you get tires on the car, you make sure that all the white writing and the white wall is on the inside. You can't have it sh- sticking out when you put your tires on the car. The whites of the tires have to be on the inside. You put stuff on the outside, you're too showy. You've ruined your sanctification. Get you a car, great. Don't get a chrome bumper. You get a chrome bumper, you're too showy. You got to get a bumper that's flat black. Not, sh- not shiny black, flat black. You've lost your sanctification if you don't do these things and live by these rules. You're not set apart enough. On and on and on, these these lists of man-made rules. Listen to me. You can only be sanctified by the blood of Jesus. Period, man. It also gives peace. Thank God for peace. Some folks in here ain't got peace today. Because you know you ain't been living right. It's tore you up on the inside. Something sideways in your life, you can't even rest well at night. Let Jesus' blood serve as a balm to you today. It will soothe you. Comfort you. Just take him on. The problem with us is we look at our problems too much. The more you look at your problems, how many know they do grow? And they get so big, you don't think even God can handle them. But if you'll just keep your focus on God, all this other stuff will set place like it needs to. And you'll have a peaceable life. That's what I want for my wife and myself and my family. We want to live a peaceable life. I'm tired of the hustle and bustle and stuff. I want to get up in the morning, eat biscuits, molasses, eat a little lunch, go hunting or fishing, you know, pat the kids on the head, love on Miss Kristen a little bit. Preach a little bit, live life, and let all this madness go bye-bye. And live a comfortable, love God, love my neighbor, work hard, do the right thing, let God be God, I'm not. Hunt, fish, did I say that? You, You get the picture. And live a peaceable life. I don't need the other stuff anymore. I'm busy enough. Jesus' blood can provide that for you today. No guilt. I'm running short, but guilt is, listen, you need to understand this. The blood of Jesus, when it's applied to you, Jesus, through, God through Jesus, always sends love your way. Grace your way. 
mercy your way. Constantly coming. Constantly coming. It never breaks down. The guilt's on our part. We do something we're not supposed to do. We immediately erect walls of guilt. And those walls of guilt come up and we do the backing up. We start thinking, oh my God, Jesus doesn't love me like he used to. Oh my God, what have I done? We do that. Listen, you got to understand, if you've got the, the blood of Jesus applied to you, there's no guilt in the kingdom of God. He understands. Listen, his, his love is for you. He is for you and not against you. He is constantly wanting to do good things for you. It is coming to you. Sometimes you don't see it. Because according to the book of Ephesians, this world makes our eyes grow dim. And that's why Paul prays that prayer in Ephesians chapter 1. I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened and you'll see the greatness of God that's being extended towards you. We can't see it because this world beats our brains in sometimes and we can't see it. Our eyes grow dim, but I'm here to tell you, there's none of that. God loves you and is for you. Constantly coming at you. Full speed ahead. Thanks be to God for the blood of Jesus.